Michael Boyles, strengthcoach.com presents the Strength Coach Podcast, brought to you by Perform Better, the experts in functional training and rehabilitation, performbetter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 173 of the Strength Coach Podcast, the official podcast of Michael Boyle, strengthcoach.com, the world's best source for strength and conditioning information. You can try strengthcoach.com out for three days for just a buck, and if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you, up to 50% off, depending on how many people you got. Check it out at strengthcoach.com. I'm your host, Anthony Renna, and the show notes are located at strengthcoachpodcast.com. Want to get in touch with me, shoot me an email to strengthcoachpodcast.gmail.com. All right, today on the Coach's Corner, I spoke to Coach Boyle about his article, Seeing is Believing, a forum thread called Pinch Ankle Mobility, and Kevin Carr's article, Training to Prevent Hamstring Injuries. That and much more coming up on the Coach's Corner in a little while. Aaron McGurr from Perform Better joins us to talk about the current sale and the upcoming education schedule. For the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment, Rachel Cosgrove is on to talk about knowing your numbers. For the Hit the Gym with the Strength Coach segment, I have Carson Jensen, founder of Yes to Strength and creator of the Flexible Periodization Method, as well as the author of Performance Optimization with Periodization. He's on to talk about, yep, what else? All things periodization. That and much more coming up with Coach Jensen in a little while. On the Art of Coaching with Exos, Stefan Underwood finishes his three-part segment on fostering a coach-athlete relationship. The third segment is on your team and your culture. And for the functional movement system segment, Jimmy Yuan is on to talk about the difference between FMS and SFMA. Lots of things to get to, so let's get on the phone with Coach Boyle. All right, now it's time for the Coach's Corner with Coach Boyle. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Anthony. How are you? Doing great, doing great. Um, want to get to the forum. Let's start with... Um, they, uh, well, one of the things is seeing is believing. You wrote an article on seeing is believing, which kind of relates to your uh, does it hurt article, um, goes back to that. So uh, give us an overview for everybody who hasn't seen the seeing is believing uh, concept. Well, I think the seeing is believing concept is just sort of telling coaches to not only watch I'm not only listen to their clients, but watch their clients because I think I started out with the line. I don't have the article in front of me, but that clients lie. And even the best and most well-intentioned clients will lie. And I think that's kind of the crux of the article is that you may say to somebody, hey, how, you know, that bother your back? No, 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 it doesn't bother my back at all. And then they walk away and they're kind of, you know, extending their lumbar spine and bending forward and rubbing their back. And you think, it didn't hurt their back. Why are they showing me all this body language that says, that hurt my back? And then a lot of times you go back and you say, you sure it didn't bother your back? And they're like, no, it's not a big deal. And then sort of as you keep scraping the layers off of you get from no to it's not a big deal to, well, that always hurts my back. And so I think it's just encouraging coaches, trainers to really continue to, to not only just ask questions, but to look and to watch and to realize that there may be, there literally may be not more than meets the eye, but what does meet the eye. So you've got to be looking as well as listening. Yeah, and I think what something that I've tried to do is, um, because you're right, it's very hard. And, and, and I think even when they're not lying, sometimes people forget. So in my, I have a questionnaire that I, I have them fill out at home, so I send them a link before their first session. So I feel like there's less pressure at home. They're not trying to rush through it. They can think about it. Um, and then when they, we come in, we go over it. And so I basically ask, like, okay, anything with the ankle? No injuries? Okay, no knees, no hips? You know, and I go up the line. And, you know, sometimes I get some stuff in the conversation with them that I, that I didn't get maybe in the questionnaire. But even even with that, then there is, like you said, you have to kind of keep – uh, your eye on things because I have a few clients that, you know, who I've put the shelf on, you know, 
some exercises on the shelf for a while, and then, you know, they don't like that, and then they're going to try to... So it's funny. I'll probably have them lie later on when they get to know them better, as opposed to early on when they're kind of exposing everything and they don't know what's to come. And then later when you take stuff away, now they're afraid to to tell you the truth. Yeah, no, I, that, that's why I, I think that was the real crux of the article is that idea of make sure you're watching. Don't just take everything as face value. Don't just look and say, okay, they said that doesn't hurt, but look and say, is their body language supporting their language? Because we've got to realize that we've got two different things going on, both language and what they're verbalizing and then their body language. And as you said, I, I don't think, and that's sort of the point I tried to get, it doesn't make them bad people. It's just that a lot of people have been told all kinds of foolish things, no pain, no gain, or don't worry if it only hurts a little, or if it warms up and goes away, don't worry about it, or all these other things that in reality are just not not probably what we want to be promoting from a training standpoint. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, and I don't say particularly when we're talking about our adult clients, but I think that's probably also a lie because I think it applies to everybody. I think even with your athlete clients, you want to know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're consistently having somebody doing something that's produced pain either during after, or even I always tell people, I want to know the next day. I want to know two days later. I want to know. I always tell people we should have a normal muscle soreness pattern, which basically means that day one after you're a little bit sore, your fourth or day three is gone. I even tell people where the soreness should be. The soreness shouldn't be. If the soreness is under your kneecap or right in front of you and you patella tendon, if the soreness is in front of your shoulder, those are all going to be bad spots that I don't want. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, that really hurt my back. And then they'll show me like the key spine. They'll be like, it hurts up here. I'm like, darn, but that's just muscle. <laughs> Whereas if someone comes in and says, you know, it hurts my back. And I say, where? And they point to the ASI joint or to their lumbar spine. I usually think, okay, that's more. I'm going to give that a little more credence as we move forward. Yeah. And this really proves the, the whole art of coaching, the importance of art, the art of coaching and experience because, you know, you're also getting different personalities because there's some adult clients that are going to push through it and they're used to it or they played sports or they want it. They're like, no, that's not really pain. No, no, you're supposed to push through it. But I think, you know, to your point about the athletes is it's even harder with the athletes because, you know, a lot of guys are going to sit here and say, well, you know, that's all well and good, but I got 25 guys that I'm working with at a time and it's hard to watch, which means you have to watch even that much more closely, especially because they're in a group and they don't want to fall behind and they're going to feel like, no, I got to keep pushing through this. Yeah, there's no question. I think, as you said, I think your athlete clients can, generally speaking, be your worst. But sometimes it's your personal training client. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cool. So let's move on to, I'm finding a kind of a trend and I don't know if it's just a circular thing on strengthcoach.com, you know, so we've, we have some, you know, newer members, et cetera, and kind of, you know, getting involved in the threads. And, um, you know, for example, one of our, our top threads was the, um, kind of is, is, are we crossing the line into the physical therapy, uh, realm as strength coaches. And so we've, we've talked about this a lot on the, on the uh, podcast and, and in the forums, but there was a, a thread pinch ankle mobility that got a boatload of, uh, play. You're in there, Brett Jones, Anna Hartman, who's had some great stuff, Brad, Brad Kazmarski. Um, talk to us a little bit about this thread and kind of where it led. And, and do you feel like we're, you know, it's leading to again, crossing that line? Well, I think it's funny. I think that's almost part of the reason for our site is that we're always dealing with that line with people in terms of, okay, because I think if you look at it, if Greg Cook is a physical therapist. If you look at me, I'm not a physical therapist. Theoretically or technically, I'm an athletic trainer. But I think, you know, a guy like Charlie, Charlie Weingroff's a physical therapist. I think there's a lot of people that, that are dabbling on either side of that line all the time. And so I think those are the best dialogues. I thought that was a really good because I thought it brought up this sort of Kelly Starrett mobility walk thing and is that good or bad? And again, I have, I have my opinions. I'm not a huge fan. I, I love the idea. I think if you look at, you know, much like I say with CrossFit, Kelly has made mobility kind of a household word in our industry. 
you know, across a very broad range of people. That's a really good thing. There's a lot of people thinking about mobility. There's a lot of people trying to develop more mobility, but there's also a lot of, it's like, uh, you know, I, I always use the home brain surgery line, but it's that idea that there's also a lot of home brain surgery. You know, you've got people out there thinking, oh yeah. And, and it's interesting. And you've got a guy like Chris Lee, and Chris is great on the forums because he provides a very different opinion. He doesn't agree with me. He doesn't agree with everything I say. I think those are the people that we need. And, you know, as you said, Anne has been great. Anna, I actually is somebody that, you know, she joined and I kind of invited her. I was like, Hey, you know, I'd love to have you on the forum or I'd love to have you off more opinion. She sort of, she started out working with Sue self Sony at athletes performance and then took over when Sue left. And she's very smart. And they've all got their own ideas about, she's a little more of a, I don't know, I guess a, a little more of a neural person. And Chris is really like, okay, test, retest, you know, if it doesn't, doesn't hurt, don't worry about it. And, and I think, you know, with a guy like Chris, I'd be interested to see what Chris's age is because I think he strikes me as somebody that's young because he's a little bit more daring, which tends to be the way the young, younger people are. Whereas I look at it and think I'm a lot more conservative in terms of what I want to know. And even when I started doing things like ankle mobility and, T-spine mobility. I can still remember Sue Falcone showing us the T-spine mobility with tennis ball years ago. I don't even know. It could have been 10 years ago, 12 years ago that she actually showed us that. And I remember asking the question. I said, could I do it too much? Could I get too much T-spine mobility? Could I over-mobilize this area to the point where I was destabilizing it and having a problem? And I remember her words saying, no, that probably could never happen, so don't worry about it. And that's the kind of stuff that I want to know. And so it's interesting, even with my talk, um, I'm going to do a talk December 12th down at the Perform Better, what they're calling their Functional Training Institute, so at their headquarters, and talking about um, PRI and some of that stuff. And the, the PRI guys do a really, really good job of talking about hip mobility and the idea that there is sort of an ultimate or an optimal hip mobility situation in the sense that to much isn't good and too little isn't good. And you've got to be right in this, um, this kind of sweet spot of hip mobility to really benefit. You've got, you know, you want 10 degrees of extension, but you don't want to be able to do a split and you want say 15 degrees or whatever it was of internal rotation, but you don't want 45. And so I think that's why there's a lot of stuff as we look, um, we've got to realize that there's, there's just a lot going on. It's not, nothing is simple. And we've got to make sure we realize it. It's nothing is simple. And let's, let's look at, let's, I think it's great to explore the lines verbally with each other through the forum and maybe not so much with our clients through a little experimentation or trial and error or test retest kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think the hard part is, you know, we get a lot of mixed messages. There's, a, there's, a, for example, somebody gets hurt. Okay, we're supposed to refer out. Um, not all of us are close to a therapist that they really trust. We're really not. I mean, I'm and I'm a small facility, and I tried to get a therapist in here. I went through a lot of different, uh, a lot of different companies, and, and nothing was really working out. So I kind of gave up on it. And I actually, if you said to me, a uh, physical therapist, where where would I go? I I'd have to send you to New York City, to Charlie. So 25 miles away, and most of my people are not going to go there. I can't send anybody there. So there's still that problem. Even for me lately, I just sent somebody to one of my clients who was really focusing on losing weight, and I, I had to give up because I felt like it was the nutrition piece. So I sent them to a place called Fat Fat burn who, you know, they do both. They do exercise and, you know, she's a dancer and she's already burning enough calories. I was trying to do strength training twice a week and we were making some great progress, but she needed like some serious nutrient timing and some serious, you know, nutritional advice. So I had to give her up. I, I sent her, I went over and talked to them, kind of gave them, gave them, gave her to them. It's hard to do, though. I mean, it's money out of our pocket and at the same time trying to help people. But I think it's really hard, this whole kind of, you know, refer out. And then we're hearing, like, Greg Rose say, no, don't refer out. There's certain, you know, wait, just because they're in pain doesn't mean you have right. to refer out. You don't know what kind of pain it is yet, you know. So it's a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing to do. And it's, I think it's hard to figure out where the line is. I think sometimes by referring out, I think you do – um, 
you do get more. I think more comes back. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the part you've got to look at and realize that, yeah, it may seem like I'm screwing myself, but maybe I'm not. And so you got to kind of look at it that way and say, I may be losing something in the short term, but I'll be gaining something in the long term. And you just hope that, uh, that that person at some point says, Hey, you know, I went to Anthony and although he didn't solve my problem, he was really great. And he sent me to these guys and, and I guess you, you hope. And I, I really believe in our situation that that's worked. That mm-hmm. sometimes we've looked and said, you know, with therapists and I always have, like I always say to people, I have sort of almost tiers of therapy. We have a therapist, we have John Powell from St. House who's great, but he doesn't take insurance. We've got Holly Fitzgerald who's a couple miles away who takes insurance. And then we've got some other people, sort of some other specialists that are further away, say 25 minutes or a half hour away, that if we get some really sticky stuff, maybe we refer to those people. And I think you want to keep developing that referral base. And that's why I said for someone like you, like sometimes when you think refer out, I'll refer people. I'll send them just to, to Karen Wood to our massage therapist. Mm-hmm. Say like, Karen, work on them and see, do they feel better? And then we'll start thinking about sort of attacking them from kind of a PRI model standpoint. Okay, let's attack them from the PRI model if they're right-handed at least and start working on breathing and start working on kind of repositioning the pelvis and see if that helps. Because I think in those situations, I'm actually looking at my presentation and I start, sorry, I'm getting all over the place, but I just put a slide in first, do no harm. And I think that's the thing that we've got to think about all the time is first, do no harm. But I also, then I started talking about the seminar that I was doing. So December 12th, I'm going to do what I guess is going to be functional strength coach six. I think we'll film it. I think there'll be enough new and different information. It'll take that start with why talk that I did. And it'll kind of explore. And I think a lot of these threads, they help me. So I'm, I'm thrilled when we get through this because it makes me realize what, where the problems are, what people are still failing to understand where the, the disconnects might be because it was very interesting. We had a, uh, one of my interns and we always send out that little email when people join strength coach, what are you interested in? And he was, we obviously sign up all the interns on the site for free and we signed him up and he said, Oh, you know, I'm really into Kelly Starrett's, you know, supple leopard. And I want to know all about mobility. And I thought, yeah, this, I've got to be conscious of more conscious of this now because suddenly mobility has become a really big deal and really because of Kelly, I think before, I don't think, you know, we talk about mobility and we were probably the only people kind of singing that song, talking about joint by joint and talking about developing hip mobility and talking about developing T-spine mobility. And then all of a sudden, Kelly comes along with this mobility wad, like, hey, I'm going to do something every day. I'm going to do a, a talk, you know, a little mobility piece every single day. And I don't know if he still does it every day, but I think you start to realize that when you're trying to get 365 mobility lessons, you may start to get a little fringy and you may start showing people some things that, that are really specialized, but not explaining why, you know, this, this idea that, Hey, this isn't for everybody because with the mobility piece, particularly, I think people love the idea of being able to fix people. And I know I love the idea of being able to fix people. I love when people come back and say, I feel better. Yeah. So that's why, in as I said, I'm probably talking in circles here, but that's why when you get into the, the refer out thing, okay, you know, when in doubt, refer. And I look at it and think, when in doubt, investigate. When in doubt, take them through that movement screen and really start looking and seeing does something pop up to you. You go, oh, okay, this is a real problem. When you start looking at the PRI stuff, I still don't believe there's anything wrong with looking at someone, you know, almost like postural grid pictures and saying, okay, what do I see? Do I have that low shoulder on the right-hand side? Do I have, you know, my, if I'm looking at like ASIS, am I low on the left-hand side? If I look at PSIS, is there a difference? If I look at leg length, is there a difference? I don't know if there's anything wrong with any of that. I don't know if we cross any lines when we simply do that evaluation. I think even if you look at kind of lower quarter exam and start looking at like the PRI guidelines, okay, how much internal rotation do you have? How much external rotation do you have? How much extension do you have? How much flexion do you have? What's your active straight leg raise like? I look at all that stuff and I still think I don't see anybody who's doing that falling into practicing physical therapy. I think it's when you start 
and this is where the mobility thing comes in, when you start with the intention of moving a joint, I believe that is where you cross the line or where you at least start to cross the line. And, and when you don't know, as it, particularly with some of the banded mobilizations, when you don't know which side the band is going to go on, when you don't know that there's a good side and a bad side, then I think that stuff can become problematic. So I think that's where we've got to realize it. it we're sort of encouraging people to be curious and to be investigative. And then at the same time, we're encouraging them to be cautious. And maybe those are conflicting messages. There may be people on the side who think, geez, these guys can't make up their mind. But I no, think but I th- that's part of judgment. I, I also think, you know, within – uh, what you're doing with your certification and something like functional strength code six. I don't know if there's enough time on that day. I, I'm sure there is a whole day, but you know, you should draw the lines right now. Where are your lines? And you know, for, for the average trainer, I mean, you know, let's say you're teaching interns, like, you know, what, how far are you going to let them go? You know, and to say, no, you go to here, you check all these A, B, C, D. If there's pain, don't touch them. But if there's pain, now you can send them. Now we need to go to our first level, to Karen yeah. Wood. Or the guys that I'm going to talk about next, the Movement is Medicine boys over at MVSC, but, um, who you forgot to mention, by the way, in your hmm. little. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? I think that would be important for you to add into your, you know, whether it's in the certification already or really into Functional Strength Code 6. But... Um, coach, I want to finish off with, like I said, I wanted to mention the movement as medicine boys, Kevin Carr wrote a great article training for, to prevent hamstring injuries, which is basically outlining all the stuff you guys do at, at MBSC. And one thing I do want to talk about is, and you know, really quick is, is that, you know, there isn't any, um, there's nothing in here that's going over static stretching. And I know, you know, obviously that's part of maybe your warm up. but talk to us about where you are with that. And, you know, cause again, Kevin wrote this article. Uh, somebody else might say, look, this is an article called training to prevent hamstring injuries. Um, coach Boyle does recommend static stretching. He's still a believer of that. Talk to us about where you are within there. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't even think about that when I read the article, but, I think for us, I, I think that I guess there's an assumption there that we are always rolling and stretching. I guess that would probably be the best way to look at it. So, um, yeah, we're definitely doing that. So I think I'm actually I'm kind of scanning through this whole thing as I go through and realizing that, yeah, I guess we sort of, we may miss in a really basic sort of, Spot there in terms of making sure that that we emphasize, yeah, you, you should be still continuing to roll and stretch. But I also don't think that rolling. I guess the idea is that rolling and stretching by itself, without the the well constructed program that Kevin shows, really won't prevent hamstring injuries. It, it may, I guess, reduce. But um, but other than that, it's um, you know it's really the the construction of the program and realizing that okay, we've got to get eccentric strength with our slide board leg coming. We've got to get concentric strength with our one leg straight leg deadlift. There's stuff that we've really got to do. That, and we've got to really understand how that muscle works, which Kevin did a really good job. It's really funny. Kevin writes these great articles and then he just throws them up on his own blog. And I'm not even, I don't know how many readers, followers, whatever he has, but I think that's why I always grab them and put them on our site. Yeah. I don't know how many people read them. Well, they're really in depth too. Yeah. They're so good. So that's why I've been, and he's always like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. I, I, can't, I don't think it's that the strength coach. So now, now I've asked him so many times, can I put this on? I didn't ask him anymore. I just sent it to you and have you put it on. Yeah, and they're a pain to put on because he has like 40 videos, so which is great. <laughs> but still. <laughs> but, well, it's yeah. true because as you realize, people love the video content. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely. Well, you're getting some great content from the uh, MBSC boys, Ken Whittier, Kevin Carr. Uh, everybody's doing a great job. So, Coach, we're going to leave you on that. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks, Ant. All right. Now it's time for the Ask the Equipment Experts with Perform Better, and I am here with the lovely and talented Aaron McGurr. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, I haven't done a show with you in a little bit because we had Chris on last time, but um, let's let's start out. Let's start out with the sale. Spend more, save more. What do we got? 
right now, like you said, we're having the spend more, save more offer. So if you spend anywhere between $50 and $99, you'll save 10% off of your order. When you spend $100 up to $149, you'll save 15%. And anything over $150, you'll save 20% off your order. So um, now's the time to kind of find out what you want. I know we're not having any specific products on sale. Usually when we have our products on sale, it's anywhere from 10 to 20%. So now you just take that off your whole order, which is nice because there's no limitations. Nice. Very cool. No limitations. Awesome. Um, e. Let's talk about it's that time of year. Uh, I know I looked just looked on the website and which is kind of weird. You you have the three day functional training summit uh, dates up and we have a special announcement as well for that. But you uh, you don't have the dates for the one days up except you do know when we can come visit you in New Jersey. Talk to me. I do <laughs> New Jersey. I'm biased to that one, obviously, but. That date is going to be Saturday, December 5th, and it's going to be in Fairlawn, New Jersey at the Precy Speed School, same place it's been for probably the last 10 years or so that I've been going. Um, so again, that's December 5th. We're going to have the presenters as well as the topics up online probably within the next two to three weeks, hopefully. Um, we're just trying to finalize that. So once we get that up there, registration will be open um, and we'll also be listing the other locations as well for 2016. So just off the top of my head, I know we'll be back in San Francisco. We'll be back in L.A., Seattle. Um, I think we're going to go visit Charlotte this year and Dallas. So kind of all over the place, just something to keep in mind. But, again, those will be listed shortly. Cool. And also, we do have the summits listed. Yes. So that's exciting. It's scary because I feel like they just ended. It was a little sad, but... Um, they're back up and they'll be here before we know it. So that we have Chicago, June 24th, 25th, and 26th. Providence, again, is in the middle of July, 15, 16, 17. And Long Beach is going to be August 12th through the 14th. Um, but big announcement and big news, we are actually having a fourth summit, which yes. is crazy. <laughs> so um, usually after three, we're exhausted and completely spent and it's been an amazing time but we are adding one more after people filling out their evaluation so we appreciate it but we're going to be down in Orlando, Florida so we're going to kind of visit those southern southerners a little bit um, and that's going to be our very first time in Orlando our first time having four three-day summits and the first one of the year so it's going to be June third, fourth, and fifth. So we're going to kick off the 2016 summits again with our brand new location down in Orlando, Florida. So again, once we get more information in regards to topics, presenters, things like that, hotels, um, we'll be posting that online. Usually it's not until around January-ish. I'll throw an ish on there because that's just what I do to cover myself. But mm -hmm. usually it's not until like January-ish, maybe February. So um Again, those will be coming out, so just keep an eye on it. But I know kind of as a save the date, they are listed online, and hopefully we'll have the one days up there soon. Very cool. I like it because I think May is, you know, May and June are kind of really active dates in the Northeast for uh, seminars. And uh, pushing the summit into July helps me because I like to go up to BSMPG in May and it just, you know, turn around and, and then come back up like two weeks later. It gets tough on a marriage, so... Um, but um, I know the feeling. <laughs> very cool. Um, e, thank you so much for coming on today. And uh, we're going to have you back on next week because we got some podcasts to make up. So uh, we'll talk about some more stuff. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks for having me. Hi, this is Stefan Underwood for The Art of Coaching with Exos. And this week is the final segment in a three-part series regarding the development of a strong coach-athlete relationship. Each episode, I have referenced the idea that you are only an expert with an invitation. So how do we go about earning and keeping that invitation from the athletes we serve? In the first two segments, I spoke about motivation through education and different methods of timing feedback to enhance the coach-athlete dynamic. Today, for the final piece, I'm going to speak to something I'm quite passionate about, and that is my teammates. A true seamless integration between specialists creates an athlete-centric culture. Culture is hard to define but it is certainly recognizable when you see it, and athletes will recognize if your facility has a culture they want to train within. 
there are three critical components to creating the athlete-centric culture with a seamless integration across professionals on your team. Humility, respect, and communication. Let's start with the most important and begin discussing humility. To show humility or be humble is the cornerstone of an athlete-centric culture. It cannot be overstated that we are here to serve the athletes we work with. This is about their career, their successes. As soon as it becomes about a coach gaining recognition or advancing their career, then they are using the athlete. This mindset towards service allows us to maintain perspective and ensure all decisions pertaining to a program are in the best interest of the athlete. This reminds us to stay in our lane and understand our role on a team. If I look at the team that I'm on, we have physical therapy and ATCs, registered dietitians, and performance specialists. We are all catalysts for one another. This leads us naturally right into the next component, respect. There has to be a respect among team members. For example, if I don't respect the RD on my team, then it clouds my judgment when it comes to guiding the athlete. As soon as you have a performance specialist giving dietary advice when there's an RD in the building, or as soon as you have a PT not wanting to pass an athlete on as rehab progresses and they start coaching their performance, then we have fundamental issues with culture. Ultimately, these examples do not best serve the athlete, and sadly, these scenarios arise more often than they should. If we look deeper at the first example of a coach giving dietary advice over the RD, it is important to figure out why this is happening and correct the problem as soon as possible. If the coach doesn't respect the RD because their performance is subpar, this must be addressed on the team and a plan must be developed for mentorship and continuing education to provide an opportunity for that RD to succeed. Conversely, though, if there's a great RD in a location and the problem is simply the coach not showing respect or humility and overstepping their bounds, then equally so, that must be addressed ASAP. If people genuinely care about the athlete, then all parties involved in the process of athlete development must respect each other's crafts and get on the same page. That brings us to the third and final component, getting on the same page or communication. There are two pieces to communication. First is prioritizing communication and insisting on it taking place. The second is working to create a common language and educate one another about each of our own spaces. Every Wednesday, we have a quick yet mandatory meeting. The meeting is a rundown of the athletes with an update coming from our PT team. Based around injuries, every movement pattern, upper push horizontal, upper push vertical, upper pull horizontal, upper pull vertical, etc., will be assigned a number. Zero, it's off limits. One, you do patterning, maybe isometric, corrective style exercises. Two, low impact, low intensity. A three, cleared for full movement in GPP hypertrophy theme. And finally, four, which is cleared for full movement in all performance themes, themes strength, power, like. These numbers ensure every person in our building is up to speed on the status of each athlete. The important piece here is not the numbering system but rather the degree of priority we place on regular communication relating to the clients we serve. Any follow-up questions can be handled between the parties involved offline. For example, a more in-depth conversation between an RD and a coach or a coach and a PT. What is important here is that all professionals on the team speak the same language. This stems out of continued staff education, giving us each opportunities to teach the rest of the team about our world. What ensues is a culture where professionals understand each other's worlds. Our RDs and coaches understand, for example, what a stability motor control dysfunction, or SMCD, is. Neither RD nor coach would ever profess to understand it at the level of one of our therapists, and we certainly wouldn't ever attempt to diagnose or treat. But when we get an update from the PT, we have previously taken the time to educate ourselves about that world so we can know what that SMCD is and how that will impact training and therefore how that will influence dietary advice. Every member of the team can speak at a base level to each other team member's area of expertise, but because we respect one another, this is purely to enhance communication and we still stay within our lane. When you wrap it all together, to serving with humility, respecting the other members of your team, and ensuring all parties are educated across each other's spaces and speaking the same language, the end result is an athlete-centric culture, which will be recognized by the athlete and ultimately garner trust and a strong relationship with that athlete. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the art of coaching over these last three segments and hope that it has spurred on some ideas for ensuring an optimal relationship with athletes. 
from how we educate athletes to the manner we provide feedback and the strategies we use to create the right culture, everything works together to build the strongest relationships we can with the athletes we serve. For more information about Exos Education, please visit us at www.teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Strength Coach Podcast. This is the Business of Fitness segment. This is Rachel Cosgrove, co-owner of Results Fitness and Results Fitness University. Today, we're going to talk about some key numbers. This is one of the topics that I see so many of our coaching members uh, Avoid. <laughs> I think as trainers, you know, we always we we don't necessarily like to look at the numbers. We like certain numbers. We like to look at how much weight we're lifting. We like to look at how much body fat maybe our clients are losing or how much muscle they're gaining. Uh, really, you know, we look at specific numbers that apply to fitness. But uh, we really shifting what you're looking at, shifting your focus to looking at the key numbers that drive your business, the key numbers that are going to tell you if you're getting closer to your goal, if you're getting closer to uh, you know, what you want to accomplish with your business to make sure that it's going to uh, be hitting the numbers to build a sustainable long-term company. So let's get into this. Let's get into these numbers. Uh, keep listening. I know, you know when I talk numbers right away, it's easy to, to start to drift away, but this is going to be, you know, I'm going to make this as fun as possible. So uh, first of all, uh, numbers we need to look at. We need to know base operating expense. We need to know if you own a gym, how much does it cost you each month to run your gym? What is that number? What does it cost to turn on the lights, to pay the rent, pay the payroll? Uh, how much do you need to cover your expenses? And this is also, if you don't own your own gym, you should know this number for your life. You know, really a personal base operating expense. What does it cost me to run my life? You know, my rent, my groceries. Um, you know, you should know these numbers because if you don't know that number, you don't know what you need to demand from your business. And, uh, you know, your business will actually make exactly what you demand it makes. But if you don't know what that number is, you can't actually, you know, put into place what will get you to that goal. Um, so that's number one. You got to know what you want from your business. Uh, number two, uh, you got to know, uh, you got to start tracking. You got to start tracking what's happening day to day. How many leads are you getting? I think I ask trainers this so many times, you know, they say, oh, I don't have enough clients. How do I get more clients? And then I say, well, how many leads are you getting now? And they go, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I probably get, you know, a couple leads and they have no idea. Uh, you have to know how many leads are coming through your door every month, uh, because if you don't know how many people are you know, interested in what you're doing, you don't know if your marketing is working. You don't know if the efforts you're putting in to drive those leads are really working. So um, you need to know, you know. So when I say leads, that means anybody who calls your gym, anybody who you meet, uh, anybody who basically raises their hand and says, I'm interested in what you do. Uh, the goal is to get the contact information for those leads. And, uh, you know, really that way you can follow up and you can make sure that, uh, you know, you're going to be able to get them signed up. From there, we need to track how many of those leads show up in your door, how many make an appointment, how many come in and sit down with you and uh, really listen to what you have to offer and consider joining your gym. You should get, if you get 20 leads, we should see 50 to 60% of those show up in your door. If we don't see 50 to 60% of those show up in your door, then we need to look at what kind of script are you using? What are you saying to them? Because we're not we're not getting them to, to actually take action and come in. So um, really tracking how many of those actually show up and sit down with you. Once we have that number of how many sit down and show and, and are meeting with you, we need to start tracking how many of them get signed up. And that will tell you, again, we should see 50 to 60% minimum signing up. So if we had 20 leads and 10 of them showed up and sat down with you, we should see at least five to six of them signing up with your gym. So that, that gives you a number that you know, if I need to get five to six new members every month, then I need to have 20 leads every month. And if we're not tracking those numbers, we have no idea if we're on track. We're just kind of going day to day, uh, you know, running, running through the wheel, the wheel, spinning our wheels and not getting any closer to where we want to get. So this is your wake up call. Start tracking your numbers. Uh, know what your base operating expense is. Uh, really start to track how many leads are you getting? How many are showing up in your door? And how many are signing up? And then start to drive that number. And if your goal is to get 10 new members, then we need to work backwards and really go out there and get those leads to get them to show up, sign up, and start changing lives. So that's what this is all about, changing lives, changing the way fitness is done. So uh, hopefully that gives you some tools to, to put into action immediately, uh, you know, this is something that if you do put it into action, it will absolutely change your business and change the focus of where you're going to really, um, you know, make sure your business is going to make exactly what you demand it makes. 
thank you everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, we look forward to, to having you tune in every week, um, sharing lessons on business, fitness, and changing the way fitness is done. Again, this is Rachel Cosgrove with Results Fitness University. For more from us, jump on our website, resultsfitnessuniversity.com and sign up for our email newsletter and we will keep you in the loop. Have a great day. Hey everyone, welcome to the Functional Movement Systems segment of the podcast. My name is Dr. Jimmy Ewan, based out in Arizona. And today we're just going to talk a little bit about the, the differences between the functional movement screen and the selective functional movement assessment, the FMS and the SFMA. The main difference between the two is that the SFMA was designed for people in pain. If someone was in pain, we would jump to the SFMA versus the FMS. And if they weren't in pain, we could start screening them to see developing a uh, you know, movement patterns for their, their current workouts. Um, if, in fact, the SFMA and somebody in pain was, it, it couldn't, it was not being able to be recreated, we could use the FMS to recreate the pain because the goal is to recreate the pain to find the eventual cause of the pain. The differences between cause and site of the pain would be an example would be um, if someone had shoulder pain and that would be the site of the pain, and something else in their body wasn't working right or the cause to cause that shoulder pain or the site of the pain to occur. The other difference between the two is who can really administer the SFMA. The SFMA has an online course, and what that does is allow for everyone to understand the language of the SFMA. But in order to be certified, you have to have a license to be able to diagnose and treat the pain. Those are the main differences between the two. If you'd like more information, please get on functionalmovementsystems.com and look everything up and sign up for a course and look at the online content. Thanks. All right, now it's time for the Hit the Gym with the Train Coach. And today I have on Karsten Jensen, founder of, and you know I said that right because my wife is Danish, so uh, he can appreciate the way I didn't say Jensen, I said Jensen, um, <laughs> the founder of Yes to Strength, and he's the creator of the flexible periodization method. Uh, that is a, a, a lot of manuals that uh, Carson has written, and he's condensing that, and we'll find out more about that in a minute, as well as another book called The Performance Optimization with Periodization, and that was for the Danish Federation of Sports. Carson has worked with Olympic world-class and international level athletes from 21 sports over the last two decades. So, Carson, thanks for coming on today. You're welcome. All right, hey, Manson. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, you know, when you and I were going back and forth a little bit on Facebook, uh, yeah. talking, uh, just kind of connecting, um, yeah. I thought it would be a, a great idea because I think periodization, uh, you know, is um, I don't know. I feel like I haven't really dwelled into it enough. Right. No, um, no. And I feel like it gets a little bit of a bad rap, although like you and I were talking, we probably we definitely all periodize on yes. some on some level, um, yes. no matter uh, whether we like it or not. There are obviously yeah. certainly more um, uh, advanced uh, systems to it. Uh, that we yeah. could, we could also talk about, but um, let's start out by yeah. really just talking about how do you define periodization? Yeah, that that's an interesting story because my first introduction to it was Tudor Bompas books in the early nineties, and I thought for probably about fifteen years that it was something very complicated Eastern European thing with you know. Uh, graphs of volume and intensity in waves and up and down and this and that until one day it occurred to me to look it up in the dictionary and the, the, the simplest form of, of definition of periodization means a division into periods so it's a word like a classification a categorization where you take things and put them into categories like red balls, blue balls, orange balls. Here you take a, a longer period, the macro cycle typically, and you divide it into shorter periods, the meso cycles, then with different goal structures and contents of the training program. And these uh, periods, then are then, they're then sequenced in such a way that selected physical uh, abilities or performance is maximized on a predetermined date. And that, that, that also means... Uh, tying into what we spoke about before, Anthony, that you can do it on different levels is that periodization can be infinitely simple and, and infinitely complex. So uh, an example of, of simple that I sometimes give is that if you sit uh, in the airport and you, you talk to the guy next to you 
and it comes out that you were a trainer and he said, oh, maybe you can help me with this. I've done uh, three sets of 12 of squats for the last month and then the first three weeks I made really good progress. But then it was like I hit a plateau. I, I didn't add any more weight. I didn't add any more reps and my knees even starting to ache a little bit. Then you can say, you know, assuming that your form is good and it's not anything serious with your knee, here's what you can do. For the next month, do three sets of six and adjust the weight up accordingly so you so every time you can do six reps with good form, then you increase the weight. Then you essentially have applied periodization by suggesting a change to one program variable, the number of repetitions per set, and then as a consequence of that, the load. So, and, and you've created a new period and you applied periodization. So that would be like at the simple end of the scale. I think that's where, now obviously that's a super simple example. Another example yes. was, you know, you and I were talking earlier again, is with like if we, if we just work with uh, a hockey player or, or a basketball player, whatever it may be, we know that we have a preseason an in-season, yes. and then we have uh, an off-season. So that can make things relatively easy. I think, um, like what you were talking about before, you know, your first exposure was to De Bompa, and I think to a lot of us was that that book, right? And then yes. I think the problem is it just seems so – everything's so complicated and it gets so crazy. So talk to us about, you know, a real – a little bit more of a – uh, you know, practical uh, application of some periodization. Yeah, I think when you say when you say complicated, I think where a lot of a uh, because I, I read on the you know the blog posts and the comments as well on various website websites, and I, think, uh, I agree with you that the periodization has somewhat a bad reputation. So either people are not interested in it or they think it's not useful or they say it's not uh, not scientifically validated. Um, but I, what I think that where, where it comes down to is that we think that the systems of periodization, including what Bomba created and including linear and all that, we, we use that as synonym, synonymous with the principle of periodization. So, so periodization overall is a principle for organizing long-term training. And again, if you look at the, the dictionary, it one of the the way what are the, one of the things that the principle means is a mode of action. It's a way of organizing long-term training, and you can you can do that in in many many different ways. And the the known systems of periodization that that we are familiar with, those are examples that they are not the principle. Does that make sense? Make sense. A practical, a practical example easily becomes more, more complicated. I can, I can say uh, one example that that comes to mind, which is an, a little out there because it was an example of where the traditional methods did not fit in. Was when I worked with a professional tennis player back in Denmark from from 2000 to 2007, and his reality was was not six weeks to prepare. He, the longest time off was three months, three, three weeks, sorry, in December. Beyond that, his reality was anywhere from one to five days between tournaments. So we created a plan that, that reflected that reality. So here's what you do if you have five days. Here's what you do if you have four days. Here's what you do if you have, if you have three days. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I work with golfers. So there okay. is, it's a very similar uh, situation, and I think again, like yeah. you said, with the tennis player, it's it's that's where I think people say, "Well, that's not a true period." You know, you can't periodize for somebody like that. But you know, yeah. I think there. Um, what I've tried to do with some golfers is just try to have them think about, well, what what are your key. Uh, events. What are also? I, I understand every event is important. Yes. Um, but what are the ones that are a little bit more key to you? Because I think, yes. especially with a pro player, it, the problem is uh, uh, someone who's not a top money earner. They have to keep playing in all these tournaments because they're trying to, you know, get that breakthrough win or trying to make more money to stay on tour, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes yeah. even harder because then they don't have that rest. So um, can yeah. you just talk a little bit more about working with that tennis player, I, you know, and what you did from that, from a periodization scheme? Yeah, the, it was, 
it was l lucky, quote unquote, in the sense that when we began working together, he just came out of shoulder surgery. So the first two years we, we worked together, he was off the circuit really, and that's where he made the most of his, his improvements in both strength and speed. Um, when he, he went on to play like 35 uh, tournaments a year in the, in the subsequent five years, he didn't make as much progress in, in either strength nor speed. And it, um, I think the, the overall issue that's interesting to look at there is that when we work with athletes, regardless of whether that's golfers or tennis players, it begins with, you know, what are your overall goals and what do you need to work on to achieve it? And let's just say, you know, some form of physical capacity comes up that, you know, this golfer needs improved rotational power, or which could also be the case for the tennis player, is that what does it take to develop that power to that degree that you're interested in? And, you know, that sometimes, you know, it's a certain amount of times per week for a certain number of weeks, preferably relatively continuous, right? And if, if that's not available in terms of training, then you don't see that, that improvement. So, so, you know, the, the whole issue of what does it take to develop what you, you want to develop slash need to develop. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways we try to be effective with, with periodization is sometimes to, to tell people to, after a competition, go in and do a, a short 15 to 20 minute workout because the match might as well have lasted 15 minutes longer. So you, you, you could have been in a situation where you had to do this anyway. Oh, yeah, I like that. Uh, we've had Sean Skane on here a lot uh, on the Strength Coach Podcast, and he was our, well, actually yeah. our first guest. And he, he always talked about, you know, having his players, um, they would do these 15-minute workouts after games. And yes. basically because of the fact that, um, you know, they had to wake up the next day and they were going to do a um, – a, you know, a, a, you know, a morning skate, which is always a lighter skate. Usually, if it's a, yeah. if it's a game day, it's a lighter skate. But uh, he he just felt like, you know, they were they were warmed up already. Like you said, it could have went, it could go into overtime. I never even really thought about that. So you know, at least they're prepared no. for uh, going a little bit longer. But um, really, it, it had more to do with uh, being able to recover and and the timing of it. So that's interesting that you said that. Uh, speaking of uh, what you could do on, on game day, there's a very interesting tradition in in basketball. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It was relayed to me by uh, the strength coach from the Toronto Raptors. And uh, the, on his first, very first home game, the Toronto Raptors were to play the, uh, the Lakers. And uh, John Lee, which is uh, the strength coach for the Raptors, at least two years ago when I spoke to him, I'm, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, he came uh, 7.30 to set up the room for 8 when the Raptors were supposed to meet. And uh, in the gym, he found uh, Kobe Bryant with his personal trainer and, uh, and a bodyguard, I believe, uh, bench pressing 225 pounds. And supposedly it was Michael Jordan that, that started the, um, you can say, the, the habit that you could lift on game day and then they find you actually get better from it. I'm not sure about the volume or how many exercises and things like that, but they actually do lift and I would assume it's pretty heavy even for him at, uh, on game day. Yeah, I mean th that that's another uh, another argument I guess that you know we could have all day here is you know I think yes. that's going to always be different for everybody, right? Yes. Um, yes. So, and also yeah. I think it has to do with uh how you feel like you want to prepare for yes. your event. So, you know, some guys some golfers want to go and just get a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Uh now pa periodization we were talking about gets a bad rap. Yeah. Uh, uh, talk to us about you know, when people say things like, you know, there's no scientific evidence for periodization or periodization is impractical. Yeah. Um, just just give us a little bit of, uh, you know, the, uh, the in your defense of periodization. Yes. I think one of uh, one of the absolute key uh, principles to, to that supports periodization and in the definition that periodization is about having different periods in the training is the principle of accommodation that is uh, described in, in Satsioski's book, The Science and Practice of Strength Training. It, uh, it, it, it's a curve that shows on the horizontal axis time, so number of workouts or weeks. On the vertical axis, it shows performance gains. And it, 
it begins in this way that when you begin in a new workout, the performance gains are large in the beginning and then they gradually taper off until you reach a plateau. Almost mm-hmm. everybody that I ever ask you know, have experienced that. They say, you know, have you ever started a new workout and made good gains? Absolutely. Have you ever experienced that after a few weeks the game seems to taper off and you reach a plateau? Absolutely. So it's a very familiar scenario. And uh, overall, the, the, the way the law is stated is that uh, the response of a biological object, in this case, the human body, it decreases over time to a, to a constant stimulus. And then uh, Einstein's beautiful saying comes into play that uh, the definition of insanity is, is keep doing the same thing yet expecting a different result. Mm-hmm. That means that when you reach this plateau, right, one or more aspects of the program should change if you want a different result. And when you then change something about the program, you're having a new period. And that's why, that's why I also say it's, it's – you, you said this in the beginning, we all periodize. That it – unless you always forever do exactly the same thing with your athletes, you are periodizing. Because you are having, you are creating different periods in the training program. So you're using it as a principle, not necessarily any of the well-defined systems that we can find in the books. So it's not so much a matter about if we use periodization, it's more about how we use it and does it create results for, for the athletes that we work with. And I see pretty much the the principle of accommodation as changing the quality of the training stimulus, like changing the uh, exercises, for example, changing the repetition, the speed of the repetitions or the structure of the repetitions. Whereas, um, whereas the next main syndrome that I think supports periodization is the general adaptation syndrome. Which, uh, which overall states that there are, there are three phases in the training response. Like there's the alarm phase that when you when you change the stressor on the body, uh, the body will go into an alarm phase characterized sometimes by by soreness and a drop in performance. Then and this is where the training effect happens. The resistance phase where we adapt to the training stimulus, for example, by becoming more flexible, creating more capillaries and endurance training, improving uh, rate coding and firing frequency and resistance training. And when we've uh, used up our adaptation reserves, we'll go into the exhaustion stage, where again, performance drops, aches and pains can occur. And then that is the time where it's time to remove the training stimulus speaking to the need for alternating periods of a developmental training load and a, and a recovery training load. So again, it speaks to periodization as a principle, not any of, any of the specific systems that we're familiar with in the literature. I think those are, those are the two main ones. Uh, at the, the last main one is how physical abilities are connected so we can look at things like strength and flexibility, for example, and we can say when we look at those qualities and the way we know them, do we, do we see an understanding of that if we develop one before the other, then we can develop the other uh, more safely and more effectively? And I think one of the most visible examples is, is flexibility before strength. If you look at something like squats or deadlifts, a lot of the, the athletes I've ever worked with, including trainers that come to our workshops, they can't immediately, for example, squat to parallel or squat deep while maintaining a straight back and, and their knees in alignment. Neither can they, they deadlift with the bar from the floor with a straight back. But if they work on, for example, hamstring flexibility a little bit and hip flexibility, they can do that. So we, we have here that if you develop flexibility first, then you can practice strength and squat and deadlift more safely, more effectively next. And that first and next, that's sometimes a dynamic of weeks. And sometimes if someone is really close to having the enough flexibility, just you know, just from the warm-up, they will get the necessary flexibility. I think another very vis- visible example is if you take a, a beginner, probably someone who's a little bit like a, like an adult, and you've you read that you know high intensity interval training is great 
So you tell this person who's never trained before, you know, sprint as fast as you can for 20 seconds and then you'll, I'll give you 10 seconds of rest and we'll do that eight times. What's going to happen? If they, if they don't get injured, they, the, the result is going to be that they're not going to run that much faster than if you told them to run for three minutes, for example, and rest for a minute. And again, it, we, we see that if they don't develop that stability and structural strength and movement speed first using those really short intervals doesn't make a whole lot of sense so i think you know in in listening to some of it so far yeah. is that we like i said yeah and we agree that we're we're all periodizing especially if we work yes. with an athlete um but the, i guess the question becomes i mean how deep do we really need to get or how much more do I need to learn about periodization if like for example I know that there's in a preseason and I'm I'm doing something different in preseason I'm doing something different in uh in, in season and I'm changing it up I might change a couple of different phases um and then I'm doing something different in the off season. So, so how much more? I mean, because that's a pretty simple concept. If I just said to somebody, "Listen, you're yeah. going to train a golfer or a hockey player or whatever," you know, there's going to be these different seasons. Make sure you know. I might say you're going to work a lot more on your speed and on your strength in the off season. Then we're going to get a little closer to uh, speed in the in the preseason and the in season. We want to maintain our strength and and uh, maybe even make some gains in strength. How much more do I really need to get into periodization than that? Yeah, yeah. The, the my my answer to that was that when I when I started learning about it and when I started teaching it, which was, which was in about 2010 when I started teaching it, uh, I, I still only had in my head it was like an all or none, like it was very very deep or complicated or not at all. And then from you know from the f- I got a feedback from a lot of uh, trainers here in Toronto. And they say, you know, we don't have time to do that. And and gradually, it I, I kind of started to see how it is not an all or nothing proposition. It's it's a it's in a spectrum. So you can go from use periodization from the very very simple scenario that we spoke about in the beginning essentially to to the level needed to create results for the persons you are working with. And the 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 deepest level is involves all program variables for all the types of training that you are conducting, including progressive overload. So for example, what how should the intensity progress from week to week within a mesocycle and across mesocycles uh, for the whole macro cycle? And asking that same question for all program variables, for all the type of training that you, you conduct. How should tempo progress from week to week and across mesocycles uh, for the types of training that you conduct? And that when, this, is, this is one of the, this, the, the aims with the flexible periodization method is that my goal with that, and this is why it's 11 one-day workshops at this one point, point in time, is that the full version of the method answers all the questions that can come up when we as trainers uh, are creating a training program. It doesn't mean that a trainer always uses the whole thing, so to speak, but it means that you know some trainers will use some of it, other trainers will use other parts of it, depending on how deep they prefer to work and depending on, on the athletes that they work with. And I think, you know, the higher level athletes that you work with, sometimes the deeper you may have to go and sometimes it's the other way around. We do look at it as either, wow, I don't have enough time for that because it does, there does seem to be a lot involved when I could just say, well, I'm going to, you know, and again, exactly the way you just explained it. Am I, yeah. you know, how am I changing those different variables and, and making sure that I'm changing every variable whether you know it's it's you know th- across the mesocycle or uh, within that mesocycle, yeah. so as long as long as I'm kind of doing that, even if I'm not specifically doing it, um, maybe on purpose, right? <laughs> or yes. you know, sometimes I guess where yes. people uh, are just getting bored. But um, just give me some ideas, a little bit more about 
the flexible periodization method, which is which is what that's your method, um, yes. and how it might differ from some other periodization methods. Yeah, well, um, it differs uh, differs in a few ways. One of the uh, one of the ways it differs is that, and this is one of the reasons it's called the flexible periodization method, is that it can replicate the loading patterns of any other method of periodizations that that I'm familiar with. And in the literature, in, in one of the bones by Mike Stone, they, they talk about 12 systems. I think there are five major systems, and, and with the flexible periodization method, we can replicate all five of them. It is also uh, it, it, uh, a method for creating individualized training programs specifically, which means that all the, the steps in the program design, if you do the whole the full version is is based on the individual and not not on generic standards. However, you can consider the, the team and individuals. You can also make team-based programs with it. Um, another aspect of it is is that we say it's a holistic method of periodization. So we initially part of the assessment is at least looking at also uh, spiritual and mental emotional factors and then you know working with a like a sports psychologist if that's if that's needed um, it is also seeking synergy between all aspects of training within each meso cycle so we worked a lot on for example uh, uh, what type of strength works with what types of uh, speed and endurance what types of strength work with what type of uh, jumping and throwing. I've looked a lot into the research on concurrent training, for example. And so um, so we, um, we combine the training in the right way, so to speak. So we, we do think for, for that reason is that the flexible periodization method is together with conjugated and block periodization is probably the most complete method there is in, in terms of that it provides guidance on almost all the questions that can come up when strength coaches and personal trainers design training programs. Okay. It is also, um, um, let me backtrack one half a sentence. A couple of years to one of my workshops, a, a, a national level shot putter, discus thrower came and uh, I said, for instance, can I see a training program? And he showed me his training program, and I could see whom his strength coach had been trained by. So essentially, it, this, it, that program was not for this person. It was a program that reflected the original coach. It, it, was, it was a really good program. As, so I, I was with full respect because I really enjoy his work. I learned a lot from him for... for yeah, since the mid-90s, I could see that his coach was trained by Charles Poliquin. And, and the, the, the guy confirmed that. The guy confirmed that. And, and one of the things that I say about the flexible periodization method is that you should not see who created it or, or, or what method it was created by except from the result it produces from the person who's working with it. So it's kind of like a stealth method. And, and I can give you one of the extremes. Uh, one uh, international level badminton player I worked with in Denmark, because he did rehab at the same time, he ended up having one exercise in his program. And when his program was reduced to one exercise, he started making progress on that one exercise. On the other, on the other end of the spectrum, I've, I've had programs that were full-blown strength, jumping and throwing, and speed and energy systems at the same time, you know, totaling maybe... 25 exercises so it, there, there's nothing that's if, if you use the full method there's nothing that's preset or, or predetermined you choose all aspects of it based on what the individual needs at that point in time and it's also speak to that you know it, it's not about doing specific things it's about following principles and creating programs sorry creating results for the athletes that we work with you mentioned concurrent training, and I think it's obviously with CrossFit, it's, it's very popular. I was defined from Patrick Ward's uh, website. Yeah. It's a method that coaches use that consists of training multiple qualities at equal amounts of focus within the same training phase and often within the same workout. Um, can you just talk to us about you? Because you kind of compared, 
you had, you had like the best way of concurrent training. Uh, yeah. but, but give us your thoughts on, on the way it's done now and, and, and how you feel like you've improved. I think it. what you were, what you were saying there, it sounds like, it sounds like, like daily uh, undulating periodization where there's, for example, maximal strength, hypertrophy, or an endurance in the same week, where you said concurrent training is, is the terminology from the research literature, where there's, for example, uh, strength and endurance in the same week, or that's, that's most of the research is about is on various combinations of strength and endurance, in a couple of situations also strength and, and flexibility. You, you, what he was he mainly referring to, or should it should it just go? I think it was the, more. I think it was more about training multiple qualities. Multiple qualities. You know, what are your thoughts on that in within that phase and yeah. even within the same workout? Even even within the same workout, that is the definition of linear daily undulating periodization, where there is three training zones within the same week, and. Then the conclusions, if we look at in the literature, is that it's, it's supposed to be good for intermediate athletes, lifters, because there's a there's good variety and a good rest recovery ratio. However, it's not considered ideal for the advanced athletes because they only work on any one quality once a week, and it's not enough stimulus to make further progress. Uh, ultimately, it's it's about what are your objectives what are your goals and make sure that that those that goal and those goals get enough of a training stimulus there are also examples of where there are are specific um, opposing stimuli going on at the same time for example one of the things that surprised me a lot when i first heard it was that if you do sprint cycling and i believe it was six times six 10 times 6 seconds or the other way around, so really low volume or really high intensity, either before or after resistance training, any signaling for hypertrophy is turned off. Either before or after, any signaling is turned off. And uh, the recommendations according to the current research is is to have a minimum of 6 hours between uh, like an energy systems workout like that and a resistance training workout if the goal is to stimulate hypertrophy. So those are, I think those are some of the, some of the main considerations. There are also, uh, there are the beautiful examples of, um, of synergy. For example, beginners will develop strength faster if they, if they um, do flexibility training every other day and lift every other day. And, and one of the, one of the methods that I use a lot to help beginners develop a technique and flexibility at the same time is um, I will make sure they can engage in the correct position in a squat, for example. And then the set is a 40 to 60 second hold as steep as they can be with correct form. And then they find that over over a few weeks that they gradually sink into the into the parallel little position deeper and deeper. So there, there are some awesome synergies there as well. We're also all familiar with the synergies between strength and power uh, through post-Titanic potentiation. But for the advanced lifter, that's yeah. probably not the best route. No, not, not too much at the same time, no. All right, Carson, so let's finish up with just kind of going a little bit over what you teach in your certification. This is the flexible periodization method that yes. you teach. Just, just give us, an, a people, an overview and uh, about what this consists of. And then, um, you know, we're going to have links to, on my on TrainCoachPodcast.com to, uh, to your site for more information about your seminars, et cetera. But talk to us about this, your method and, and how, like, what is the process of teaching and the different levels and different uh, certifications. Yes, so the 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 they are, there are four levels, and they are they are one weekend of teaching and one online course, followed by a a, a multiple choice exam or a, or a case study exam at level four. And the first level is about principles of periodization and how you can apply them without a written long term training program. That's uh, that's the first day of teaching. The second day of teaching is periodization and flexibility training because it it's before the principle is flexibility before strength and that's why we have it early. And the the online 
part is how to create a needs analysis, which is also a prerequisite for uh, avoiding a training pro a good training program with the wrong goals. So that's level one. Uh, as short as I can say it, there it is. It is a lot of material. Uh, level two is is about mastering uh, the variable of exercise selection for resistance training. So we have a periodization of exercise selection. So how you periodize exercises over time, the principles for that. And we have exercise creation. One of the things that are extensively used in the flexible periodization method is combination exercises. So where we sequence typically two or three exercises. So the two or three exercises essentially is one set. And it teaches seven principles for doing that. Uh, the last part of that is periodization of repetition tempo. So there's a lot of good, very good research on that, uh, demonstrating that the tempo and the structure of the repetition helps determine the training outcome. So principles and specific examples for periodizing that in level two. Level three is periodization of strength and power with a flexible periodization method. And level four is periodization of speed and endurance, as well as 11 steps for how to create the training programs, or um, as we say it, are your training programs hip, holistic, individualized, and periodized? So that's that's where it all comes together. And in between uh, in between the levels, there are, there is support in the sense that you know anyone who goes through can ask me questions uh, because I'm, my ultimate interest is is to give trainers a tool that they can actually apply and they they feel improves their daily practice. That's, that's pretty much the, the short version of it. Uh, I'll remind everybody you can go to yes to strength.com and again we'll have those orders uh, those uh, those links at uh, strengthcoachpodcast.com. So Carson, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, you're welcome, Anthony. My pleasure. All right, well, that's going to do it for episode 173 of the Train Coach Podcast. Special thanks to Chris Pryor, Aaron McGurr, and the folks over at Perform Better. You can check them out at performbetter.com for all their products and info on their educational seminars. Don't forget, they just posted the one-day seminar schedule as well as the three-day functional training summit schedule. Thanks to Coach Poyle and Carson Jensen for sharing their insights and philosophies into the world of strength conditioning and performance enhancement as well as periodization. Rachel Cosgrove for the Results Fitness University Business of Fitness segment. Check them out at resultsfitnessuniversity.com. Jimmy Yuan and the Functional Movement Systems. Check them out at functionalmovement.com. Stefan Underwood for his insights into the art of coaching with Exos. Check them out at teamexos.com forward slash hashtag education. Don't forget audible.com is giving Strength Coach Podcast listeners a special offer. To download your free audiobook today, go to freebookfromant.com. Again, that's freebookfromant.com for your free audiobook. And of course, remember you can join strengthcoach.com and have access to the site for just one buck. That's three days for just one dollar. Once your three-day trial is over and you decide to become a member, you'll be able to download Coach Boyle's two books, Designing Strength Training Programs and Facilities, as well as Advances in Functional Training. And remember, if you have a staff of two or more and you want to sign up as a group, we have a special membership offer for you up to 50% off, depending on how many people you got. To access that offer, go to shrinkcoach.com, click the Join Now button to get started on your trial. My name is Anthony Rana, and you can reach me at Coach Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks again, and I'll speak to you next time.